Okay. Um, hello, class. Welcome to another lecture in our college course about the evolution of the Ottoman royal women. So today, um, we're going to be talking about Harem Sultan, who lived in the 1500s, and how she led to a shift in the harem system and brought more power to Ottoman royal, royal women. So, to understand why she was so important in the evolution of the Ottoman royal women, we're going to need some context about the harem system in the 1500s. In Today's world, we have a lot of perceptions when it comes to the harem. I know the media likes to think of it as like a lustful, hypersexualized, sensual place, but I want you to take those Western perceptions and toss them out the window. That is not true. Um, the harem system was a very carefully planned political system meant to produce competent heirs um, that could potentially become the next Ottoman Sultan. So one of the main components of the harem system in the 1500s is that all concubines, who were the producers of heirs to the Ottoman um, throne, all these concubines were slaves. So there were three main reasons for them being slaves. The first being is that as slaves, they had no ties to foreign powers. Um, most concubines became slaves because they were kidnapped by slavers from their homelands. And due to this, they lost all contact and ties to their family. They were not upper class women, they tended to be lower class women. And since these women did not have any ties to monarchy, they could not ask their homeland to interfere in Ottoman affairs, which is why the Ottomans liked using slaves. Another reason is since they were slaves, they were kept in the harem and had no contact really with the outside world. As such, they would only be devoted to raising royal children because that was their only stake in life, was their children. They weren't involved in any outside affairs. Finally, for the past several generations, the Ottoman sultans had come into the practice of not taking legal wives. This was because at the very beginning of the empire, when they did take legal wives, they tended to be royal women from Christian nations, and um, they would often ask for their homeland to intervene in Ottoman affairs, and they didn't like that, so they stopped taking legal wives. Another important feature of the Ottoman harem system in the 1500s was that each concubine was only allowed to have one son with the sultan. Once a concubine gave birth to a son, all intimate contact between her and the sultan was cut off, and it became her sole duty to raise her son, educate him, make sure he was competent, so that way he could potentially become a good sultan. And this was very high stakes for these concubine women. It was their job to protect and guide their son due to the Ottoman policy of fratricide. So it wasn't like in European politics where the eldest son was immediately the heir to the throne. In Ottoman politics, it was believed that all sons of the Sultan had an equal stake in becoming the next in line to the throne. So when the Sultan died, all his sons would fight for power, and the son that won would become Sultan, and he would then have all his brothers executed. So if the concubine wanted her only son to live, she had to make sure that he was educated, had allies, knew how to rule. In addition, if her son was executed, she would be sent off into exile. Her status would be lowered and she would not have a lot of wealth. Also, it was important for them to only have one son because in Ottoman policy to train a son to become a sultan, he needed to learn how to rule. Since the Ottoman Empire was a vast empire, they had many different provinces. So when a prince came of age, he was sent to a certain province chosen by his father where he would learn how to rule in a small microcosm. And then his mother would go with him to make sure, to monitor him, to make sure that he was following his duties, was ruling effectively, and she would also give him advice on this. As such, since these royal women were slaves, they had very limited power, and they generally could only exercise this power once their sons came of age and they left the harem and went to the provinces. So their power was pretty much limited to charity and patronage. So in these provinces, they could um, sponsor um, soup kitchens, they could have complexes built to help the poor, and that pretty much was all they were limited to. They weren't involved in political affairs, they couldn't advise the sultan, their main job was centered around their royal children. Sorry about that. So that was the system that Harem Sultan was coming into. So for Harem Sultan's early life, she was born in the early 1500s, probably around 1507 in what is today modern day Ukraine. Um, at the time of her birth, that was still a part of the Kingdom of Poland. Um, it is believed by historians that her birth name was either Anastasia or Alexandra. 
However, when she came to the Ottoman Empire and was entered into the harem, she was given a more Turkish name and she was given the name Harem. She was captured and sold into slavery by Tartar slavers when in her early teenage years, so she was probably around anywhere from 13 to 15. And she was eventually purchased and brought to the old palace in Istanbul. So the old palace um, was the location of the harem for many generations. And it was located in Istanbul because that was the capital of the Ottoman Empire. And that's where the Sultan also lived. Upon entering the harem, she was educated and trained to be a concubine. This is important to note because unlike Western ideas where the Sultan saw a beautiful woman and said, OK, I choose you to be my concubine, concubines had to go through rigorous education. They had to be taught the Turkish language. They had to be taught how to, to help guide their sons through political matters. and so. She had to be specifically chosen by someone within the government to become a concubine. So at the time that she entered the harem, Sultan Suleiman I had just ascended to the throne after the death of his father, Sultan Selim I. So she became his concubine sometime before 1521. And so this is a picture or, of a statue of Harem Sultan in Ukraine in what they claim to be her birth town of Rohatin. So that's still there to this day where people can go see. Um, so once becoming Suleiman's concubine, he and her began to radically break with a long-standing imperial tradition. And this began when she gave birth to more than one son. So in 1521, she gave birth to her first child, which was her son, Prince Mehmed. And instead of severing all intimate contact with the Sultan, she proceeded to give birth to the Princess Mirima and the Princess Abdullah, Bayezid, Salim, and Chihang year over the next 10 year period. As she had continued to have more children with the Sultan, affection and love grew between them. And he actually freed her from slavery after the death of his mother, Hafsa Sultan, in the early 1530s. This was, again, a major break with imperial tradition because concubines remained slaves until the death of their master, which was the Sultan. And it was only then that they were freed from slavery. But instead, he chose to free her during his lifetime and then proceeded to marry her and make her his legal wife in probably around 1533 or 1534. So this goes back to breaking with centuries on tradition because they had only used slave concubines and it was only very early in the empire when they had married wives. Another break with imperial tradition was that after a fire in the old palace, she moved to Talkabi Palace with her children. So Topkapi Palace was the residence of the Sultan. He did not sleep or live in the harem. The harem was only for the women in his family. Um, Topkapi Palace was also the central location of um, Ottoman politics, and it was where government um, officials lived, and it was also where political matters occurred. So not only did this shift the location of the harem to Topkapi Palace, it also brought Ottoman royal women right into the heart of Ottoman politics. While they still were not allowed to be advisors or hold government positions, they were now in the same building as the government, so she opened the door to let them gain more influence in political matters. And finally, as her sons aged and left to their provinces where they would learn to rule, she remained behind in Tokopi Palace with her husband and also her daughter, Mirima. As her sons aged, she began to influence, uh, utilize her power and status so she did this through philanthropy, although she did it with a twist. She is noted for having a lot of soup kitchens, bathhouses, and mosque, com mosque complexes built. But she did this in Istanbul, the capital. Prior to this, concubine mothers were only allowed to build and do these charitable works in the provinces where they lived with their sons. They were not allowed to have access to the capital in that way. So by her building in Istanbul, not only did it show that the Sultan had favored her, but it also showed that she was gaining more power for concubine women and that they were now going to be allowed to have more power in the capital. In addition, she was given the title of Hasiki. It was created especially for her by Suleiman to show her status. So Hasiki means the favorite, so it basically meant that she was the favorite concubine. Um, so that during her reign, she is known as, you know, the favorite concubine was the age of the favorite because she was um, empress of the Ottoman Empire because she had legally married the Sultan. Another power she exerted that prior concubines had not before is that she was able to write letters to foreign powers 
She would write letters to the King of Poland to establish foreign relations, and she also wrote letters to Suleiman since she remained in the capital while he went out on campaign letting him know what was going on in the government, how their sons were doing, and she was also able to act as an unofficial advisor for Suleiman. But before concubines were only focused on their son in the provinces, she was allowed to remain in the center of government, know what was going on, and give advice to Suleiman on what she thought he should take, or what action she thought he should take. And in addition, as mother to, princess, to a princess and multiple princes, it was her responsibility to make sure that they were educated and, and good advocates for the empire, which she did. <coughs> As a woman with a lot of power, more so than her predecessors, and also as a woman who brought radical change to the harem system, and she was not without her controversies. Um, there were three main controversies that were speculated about throughout her lifetime. The first being her rivalry with Mahidevran Sultan, who was otherwise known as Gulbahar Sultan. So Mahidevran was a concubine of Circassian origin. She was also the mother of Prince Mustafa. Prince Mustafa was the eldest surviving son of Suleiman I. It was widely believed that he would become the next sultan because he was very popular. After a certain point, this narrative emerged that Harem had Mahi Devran and Mustafa exiled to a province because she wanted to be the only one who would be close to the sultan along with her own children. However, this is not true. They were not exiled because as we know, when a prince came of age, he was sent to a province and his mother followed him. A second controversy involved the execution of Ibrahim Pasha. Ibrahim Pasha was the Grand Vizier of the Ottoman Empire during the reign of Sultan Suleiman I. He and Suleiman were very close, and they had been close for a number of years. He was the political favorite of Suleiman. After a certain point in, during his tenure as Grand Vizier, he was executed by Suleiman. And after his execution, rumors of a long-standing rivalry between the two favorites, Harem and Ibrahim, came forward. And it was speculated that Harem had been involved in Ibrahim's execution because she wanted to get rid of her competition and be the only influence um, in Suleiman's reign. However, was she really involved? This is very highly unlikely because there is no evidence to prove that she was in any way involved in his execution. There, was even, there wasn't even evidence that they even had a long-standing feud. So it was all hearsay. Finally, a third controversy during her lifetime involved the execution of Prince Mustafa. So Prince Mustafa was executed by his father because it was believed that he was plotting with a foreign ruler to overthrow his father so that he could take power. Um, different historians throughout history have speculated that Harem, with the help of her son-in-law, Rustem Pasha, who was the husband of her daughter, Marima, plotted and gave suggestions to the Sultan that Mustafa was planning to overthrow him. So that way, with him out of the way, her son